morning. It's so good to be here. I think this might be yours. Um, and there are still many spaces where I'm Elizabeth's sister. Let me guarantee you that. I'm a second born, and so that doesn't go away quickly. Um, and this is one of the places where I'm very happy and proud to be Elizabeth's sister and grateful for the opportunity to open the scriptures together um, this morning and to see what the Lord wants to say to us. And um, we're going to jump in into the middle of the series that you as a community have been going through, looking at the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus taught his followers to pray where he restoried um, how his followers thought about prayer, how they engaged and communicated with the Father. And, and so we're going to look at the middle part of this this familiar passage. Um, and just to review really quick before we jump in, in Matthew 6, it says this, this, the way that Jesus taught us to pray is, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come soon, and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that end part there, on earth as it is in heaven, is what we want to just focus on today. And I'm going to first frame out kind of what we're looking at, and then we're actually going to be in a different passage, just to give you a heads up. Spoiler alert. Um, and, and so this is an important part of this framework that Jesus lays out. The, the power of the Lord's Prayer isn't found in, the, in verbatim repetition. It's found in the principles and the invitation that Jesus brings us to of how to think about communicating with the Father and engaging in our life on earth. And there's two main sections in this prayer, and probably my sister's a really good exegetical teacher, and she probably already laid this all out for everybody, is there's the first part of this prayer is focused on who God is, our Father in heaven, that our communication, everything, how we orient our lives begins with the person of God. And then we move at the end, there's this engagement with our real lives, our real needs, and the needs of those around us in the broken world we find ourselves in. And right in the middle, that transition phrase is this, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So that's what we're looking at today, this idea that, that as followers of Jesus, that we are both connected and engaged with the reality of heaven, of who God is, and we are directly engaged in the reality of our earthly life at the same time, on earth as it is in heaven. You see, throughout history, people, followers of all kinds of gods have always tried to escape the reality of earth by focusing on super spiritual things. But when Jesus came, he brought the two together and he said, not our, I'm not just about what's happening here. There is a reality beyond the here and now. But at the same time, I'm, not un- I'm, I'm very concerned about the redemption and, and engagement in what's happening here. And so when we pray, when we're people who pray on earth as it is in heaven, we're people that live in this tension, this bridge, that we know who our God is, who reigns and is enthroned in heaven, and yet we're very engaged in the realities and the needs and the brokenness of the community and, and, and know that God's kingdom makes a difference in the here and now, and we don't have to wait till someday in the future. So we are people of hope because we are people that are able to pray on earth as it is in heaven. We don't just look ahead and we don't just look here and now. We see both at the same time and we know that Jesus is present in both places and actively engaged. And so this is a key phrase that that really is part of how Jesus is turning upside down expectations of how this kingdom is going to come. He is saying, like, you expect one thing, but I have an even better story for you. So that's, this is really the big idea we're going to kind of unpack, is what does it mean to be people who go about our lives, who live and, and interact and have relationship and pray and believe that, we, that what happens in heaven impacts my life today. And what's true in heaven is true on earth. And, and it's really an invitation. And that's what we're going to, it's an invitation to join what Jesus is doing right here, right now, in your home, in your workplace, that we're invited to join him. But what I want to do, and this is where I think 
the Lord is so gracious to us, is he knows that these kinds of ideas are kind of hard for us to figure out what they look like, right? Like, it's like, this is awesome. We're on earth as it is in heaven, people. And then you're like, okay, so my boss is really annoying. So like, how, what does this have to do with that, right? And so we get a lot of stories in the scripture too. And we get to watch the disciples, the, the first followers that really are like the leaders, the apostles that somehow God used to like lead his church and birth it, even though they are knuckleheads, figure this stuff out. And so what we're actually going to do today is we're going to be in Acts chapter 1. So if you, want to, if you have your Bibles, you can go there. And what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take this framework that I just quickly went over. Said, how did the disciples kind of begin to figure out what this meant? Jesus taught them to pray it. But if you've been in church for a while, and even if this is your first time, this is like, I'll just give you a heads up. What we know is the disciples were taught a lot of things. It took them a lot longer for them to understand them. And so this is something Jesus taught them, and they began to like have words for. But in Acts, where we see the church being born and the people of God learning to live in the reality of a resurrected Jesus, we see his, the disciples kind of wrestle this out. And I just want us to see three kind of invitations that we find in the lives of those first disciples in Acts chapter 1. So we'll pray, and then we'll jump in to, um, to the message. Jesus, we thank you. Um, Lord, I thank you for this moment, this time together. I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're the God who speaks. Lord, you're not far off. You're not distant, but you're a God who speaks. And so, Lord, I pray that you would open our ears to hear. And Lord, would you give us courage to respond and to obey that which you're saying to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, um, so growing up uh, in the Plater household, which my parents are here today as well, it's like a family reunion today, um, the Plater house was kind of known within my friend group and my siblings' friend group as like a party house, but not that kind of party house. <laughs> Never that kind of party house because my parents were always there. Um, but the, the house where like we would have invite, like there was a church gathering. We had a mission team that needed to have a reunion. If we, whatever it was, it was like dinner at the Plater house. And we had a big backyard. And so we had parties all the time. And as a young adult, I worked at a church, so we were always having people over. One of our great achievements was one night, my brother and I planned parties on the same night at my parents' house, and we didn't know. So we had one party in the front yard and one party in the backyard, and we had a lot of confused people that were walking up and like, I don't know anybody here. And we're like, oh, no, just keep walking. You'll find your people. They're in the back. We, it was so much fun, and, and I learned how to be like hospitable and like how to have parties from my mom and, and my parents, because they love having people in their home, and that was transferred to us. So when I got older and I began to have my own place and I moved out, I thought, great, I'm still that person. I'm a party person. I know how to host people. And so I'd start inviting people over. I'd be, we'll have that meeting at my house. And then I quickly learned something. I learned that it's a lot harder to have a party when you don't have a freezer full of food, <laughs> when you don't have all the serving dishes. You don't have like all this stuff I took for granted, right? So I thought I was throwing the party at my mom's house. The truth was it didn't really cost me that much. It was all there, right? I got to like to use her stuff and, and join in what they had already kind of committed to and arranged their home to do. And so I had to kind of, that was a rude awakening. Um, you seniors, you're gonna learn real soon what you don't have. Um, <laughs> this will be a little expensive. Um, but, but I tell you this story because I, think, I, I want to use it as an illustration. I think often in the kingdom of God, we can have that idea, um, like th that we, we actually want to have an idea a little bit more like 18-year-old Emily in the sense that really what we're invited to is like throw parties in our parents' in our father's house. 
Like that's our responsibility. There is an engagement. We invite people. We're engaged in these things. But the truth is we don't have to provide all the things. That that's God's business, that we join what he's doing. He's a God of hospitality, welcome, love, and pursuit. And so when we respond to his invitation to be on mission with him, we move in and join, and we don't have to, like, generate it all. And, and so, like, that's the picture of when we begin to talk today on what it means to be invited to join in God's mission, which is really what on earth as it is in heaven means, is if we're going to join the mission of God, we don't have to bear the burden of providing it all, of having it all, of having the strategy lay out, because we are in our Father's house. We serve from the overflow of His table. And so that should take some pressure off of us. Because it's his way, not our way, when we join. And so Jesus is inviting us to this kind of engagement with his mission. Now the problem is is that we often take responsibility for things that aren't ours. And we often have expectations that aren't in line with actually the mission that God's engaged in already. And that is okay because the disciples were the same way. So in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 6, Read to verse 10. It says this, it says, So when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, The Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching, and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So here, I just want us to real quickly orient ourselves in the story of what's happening here. Jesus has just died, came to life again, lived among his disciples, and all of a sudden, he's going to heaven and he's leaving them on the road, right? This is where we're at. The disciples have been like on an up and down emotional roller coaster. They think... You know, if you remember, there's Palm Sunday. Jesus comes in on a donkey into Jerusalem. They're like, this is awesome. Jesus is going to reign as a political king. He's going to kick Rome out. And then within a week, Jesus is crucified. And they're like, this is terrible. Jesus is dead. It's over. Three days later, Jesus is alive. They're like, what is happening, right? Like, it's just like they are all over the place. And now Jesus has been with them, and they're still trying to figure this out. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is leaving again. So this is, this is where it's a lot of confusion. Sometimes I think when we read the scriptures, we, for, we know the end of the story, so we miss some of the, like, chaos that the followers of Jesus are actually experiencing because they don't know what where this is going. And so at the beginning of what we just read, the disciples are coming to Jesus with a question. He's alive. He's defeated death. And what is this question they ask him? They ask him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And I want us, and in this question, I want us to look at here, we're going to see our first point, the first invitation in the, we want to unpack from this passage, and it's this, that Jesus invites us to transformed expectations. So the disciples are happy. Jesus is alive. He didn't stay dead. This was really a turn they weren't anticipating. But now they come to Jesus with this question, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Is now the time? Now, we can learn a lot from a question. Sometimes we ask questions because we think it, it, can, it hides our true intentions or our thoughts, but that's not really true, is it, if you really know someone? You can learn a lot from a question. I have a roommate right now, and sometimes her questions drive me crazy, right? Because she'll be like, so how did you make that decision? You know, And like, it seems so innocent, but when you know someone, you're like, okay, tell me what I didn't see. Why did I make it? You know, right? Because we like read into that question. 
Um, and that's kind of what we can do with the disciples here. They say, Lord, is now the time? What, are the, what, can, what do we know from that question? We know that they are really hopeful that this is about ready to get political and that, that we're going to throw the Romans out. They're like, if Jesus is in charge, if Jesus beat death, the, the next thing he has to do is beat Caesar. Like, that's, that is the expectation. It's been this way for years among the Jewish people that when the Messiah comes, we will be freed from our oppressors. And so it's not a bad question, but it does reveal that they still don't understand what the kingdom really means. Their expectation is still different than what, what Jesus is actually doing. And, and so in my experience, and maybe you've had the same experience, that Jesus often doesn't answer the questions I want him to. Have you ever asked God something? And he like tells you something different or doesn't engage in that part of the conversation? Um, and that's exactly what Jesus does here. In verse 7, he says, instead of answering their question, he says, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they're none of your business. I mean, that's my paraphrase. <laughs> and they're not for you to know. He says, you're caught up in the wrong thing. You're asking the wrong questions, and, and there's something bigger, the invitation so much greater and so much richer than what you're asking about. And he's not, Jesus isn't being difficult. He's saying, lift, like, like it's so much more. Your expectation is limited and I'm inviting you to see something you could never see unless you allow me to transform your expectation of what the kingdom of God is. And I know sometimes we, we, we do the same. There's, there's questions we ask the Lord like, you know, like, you know, when, when am I going to get a promotion? When am I going to have the opportunity to have this job or this and that? And often the Lord doesn't answer those questions, right? Because he's at work in us and through us. And he's like, that's not the point. Those things happen or don't happen along the way, but I'm concerned about something so, more than what you are expecting me to be. And so we have to be, learn to be people that, allowed it, to, that honestly bring our expectations and questions to the Lord. Jesus isn't mad, but we also need to not get stuck with Jesus saying, yeah, that's not what we're talking about. I have something better to invite you to. So Jesus, the Lord's like, God will take care of that. But this is the thing. In verse 8, he says, but... But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. He changes the story. All of a sudden, there's this but. And, and I want us to kind of camp here for a moment, because I think there's a few important observations to make here. Is that the disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, when is everybody going to know your power? They assume that power looks like the world around them. In the king in Roman times, power was defined by the Roman rule, Caesar, and the Roman legions. That was power. And they said, so when are you going to become the benevolent Caesar, the benevolent legion? That you're going to be good, but you're going to utilize, use the same kind of power to rule. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Kingdom power is completely different. And, and the thing we have to realize if we're going to be people who have our expectations transformed is that we often have our ideas of what power is and how God should work shaped by the kingdom and the empires around us. And we don't even know it. And that's exactly what happened here. And Jesus says, you're thinking too small. You're thinking too low. This isn't just about me taking back something. It's more. And kingdom power is different. It's not something we have. It's something that God already is. And do you notice it says, that, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. He says, you're not going to take power from the Romans. The power is in the person of God. 
God, the Holy Spirit, one of the members of the Trinity. We know come become people that take power. God has it. It's his. And yet he allows us to live and minister and steward it, but it never belongs to us. It's not about getting power back from bad rulers to good rulers. It's that it all belongs to God. And that's kingdom power. And this totally disrupts the disciples' expectations. This is totally different than what they'd been hoping for. But I think as we, th- we think about this in the, in the framework of the Lord's Prayer, what we begin to understand is that our natural instinct as humans is to pray, <laughs> Jesus, your kingdom come on earth as it is on earth. Right? Like, your kingdom come on earth as it is on earth. Like, I want your kingdom to come through earthly means. Because that's what we're familiar with. And it makes the most sense to us. But Jesus is disrupting that. And he says, you be people who pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And the kingdom comes differently. And this Acts is written by Luke. And I'm getting out of my notes a little bit here, so bear with me. Um, so Luke wrote what the Gospel of Luke and Acts. They're kind of together. They're two parts. And it's really interesting because the first part of the, the Gospel of Luke in Luke 2, we see the Son of God being born. And Luke draws this parallel to Caesar because Caesar was known. Caesar Augustus was claimed to be the Son of God. But the Son of God was born in the time of Caesar Augustus, right? And what we see is that the, the power that thought they were in control was being disrupted from the margins, from the place where nothing important was. And the hidden place of no earthly power actually disrupts the entire Roman Empire. And Caesar Augustus, who claimed to be God's son, never knew about Jesus. But within just hundreds of years, the Roman Empire like passes and then and, and the gospel goes to the nations right. because kingdom power is different than earthly power. And so Jesus says, if you're going to be people who live in the reality of heaven and function here on earth and all that I've called you to do, you have to say, pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Um, and I mean, wait, I think I said that wrong. Your kingdom. Uh, did I say that right? Okay. Good. Um, I get a little excited sometimes, but. So if we're going to be people who live with transformed expectations, we have to just acknowledge the fact that our natural instincts are often not kingdom ones and allow the Lord to make us uncomfortable and reveal that. I moved to Brooklyn, New York like four weeks ago. So I'm just tired and confused. Um, and, and so one of the things I'm li- learning about living in New York is that everything is works differently. Everything I learned from like living on the West Coast, like it's not helpful. And and so like one of the ways my life has already changed in four weeks is parking tickets. (laughs) So I spent the first 40 years of my life with one parking ticket and that was because the parking pass I had thought I could use, I couldn't use, and so I really thought I paid for parking, but there was a miscommunication and the license plate didn't match, right? So I never got a parking ticket, basically, for the first 40 years of my life. The last four weeks, I've gotten two, right? Because they're, like you can't function in New York City without parking tickets. So I have the app, I'm going to have a budget for tickets, because it just all works differently. And, and it's a little disrupting. But if we're people that are learning to live as kingdom people with right here on earth, we're going to have our lives disrupted similarly. Things we never thought we'd do, things we never thought were important are suddenly going to be places we find ourselves engaging in ways we're responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Because kingdom power is different than anything we've known before, and it's going to lead us to places and take us to places we didn't think God cared about, or we would find him there. And the good news is, is that we, the Holy Spirit, in this passage, it's very interesting. The Holy Spirit's for right where you're at. They don't, you don't have to go someplace special. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes right where you are. The promise of the Spirit is for right where we are. And then finally, when we respond to this 
Jesus' invitation to have our expectations transformed, we become proclaimers instead of conquerors. In this part of this passage here, we see that it says that you will have you will be given power to be my witnesses, right? And so there's a couple, that word witness, there's a couple ways we can understand it. But one of the ways we, it's important to, to look at it is that in Roman times, when a new Caesar came into power, they sent out heralds. That's not a word we use very often. But they sent out people that, whose whole job was to announce that there was a new Caesar in charge. And it's interesting because that's the word that we find here is that same word that would have been used for those heralds or announcers. And sometimes our natural inclination, our our expectation that's formed by the empires and kingdoms around us is that we have to go take the kingdom of God places, that we actually have to like conquer land and let them know that, that, and bring Jesus as king. But instead, the invitation here is that actually our job is to be heralds. Jesus is already king. There's just places that don't know it yet. And heralds bring good news. And as I was studying this passage, one of the things they bring out is that one thing the ancient world understood was that anarchy was worse than a bad ruler. And so when the people came, when the heralds came to announce a new Caesar, it was good news for everybody. It meant there wasn't anarchy and there wasn't going to be war. And so this, again, we see this over this kind of shadowing loop, too, in the earlier part is because remember when the angels first show up when Jesus is born, they say, good news, great joy, all people. And then in Acts 1, that becomes our message. Good news, great joy, all people all people. We are not going to conquer land for God, but we're going to announce that Jesus is king. He that is enthroned in heaven is also the true ruler of earth, and that's good news for all people. We become proclaimers, not conquerors. And then second, in this passage, we see that Jesus invites us to unexpected places. The second part of this is that the disciples find themselves watching Jesus ascend into heaven. I have no idea what they felt. But we do know that they're just standing there watching. Um, And all of a sudden, the angels show up and they ask this great question, a great and familiar question. They say, why are you standing here staring into heaven? And I think this is a question that probably all of us will be asked by the Lord at some point in our life. Because there's something in us that wants to escape the realities that we have to navigate on earth. And we just like, can we just like stare into heaven for a while? Like, cause that's the last place we saw Jesus. And that seems like a good idea, right? And, and it's a spiritual place. It's, they're not doing anything wrong. They're just like, whoa. And the angel shows up and, all, and says, why are you here? Because there's part of us that thinks we need to go up to a mountaintop and stare into heaven to have an encounter with Jesus. And this is being disrupted because the angels say, get back into Jerusalem where it's crowded, it's noisy, it's hot. Everybody's there because they went on pilgrimage and there's no room for anybody. And that's where you're going to join what Jesus is doing. Not in the place you think, in the most messy, broken, disrupted, difficult place. And, and there is this reality that although we know the, that heaven is real and, and Jesus' reign is, 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 is what we long for and there's ways that it's come already and it's not yet fully come here on earth, that, that this passage makes it very clear that we are not to spend our time just waiting for heaven. We have work to do. We have parties to throw in our, from our father's table, right? Like there's, there's good news that has to be heralded and proclaimed. And so the disciples are sent back to Jerusalem. It's not where they thought they'd be sent. It's not the spiritual place. It's not the place where we feel like God is, but it's the place where they got sent. And one of the, the, tells and the through lines in the, in the book of Acts is this, is that Acts is full of people who are going places they don't want to go and they never thought they'd go. 
And so if we're going to be people of the kingdom, we're going to find ourselves in unexpected places. Dr. Willie Jennings put it this way. He, he writes in his commentary on the book of Acts, the deepest reality of life in the spirit depicted in the book of Acts is that the disciples of Jesus rarely, if ever, go where they want to go or to whom they would want to go. Indeed, the spirit seems all, to always be pressing the disciples to go to those to whom they would in fact strongly prefer never to share space or a meal and definitely not life together. Yet it is precisely this prodding and the boundary transgressing that marks the presence of the Spirit of God. And so if we are people who respond to Jesus' invitation to be on mission with him, and we will go to places we don't want to go and don't expect Jesus to be. Jesus is in places that surprise me sometimes. And then third, this passage reminds us that Jesus invites us to prayer independency. And, on one, and this is that tension we're talking about on earth as it is in heaven. Because it's not just go do stuff in Jerusalem. What happens when the disciples go back to Jerusalem? They obey, they, they listen to the angels, they go back, and it says in Acts um, 1 verse 14 that they pray and they wait, Right? And, and this praying and this waiting does precede the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, but it doesn't stop. The book of Acts is full of praying, waiting, praying and waiting, praying and waiting. And then the Holy Spirit comes, or they, the Lord speaks, and then they respond. And so it's really interesting to me, though, that when we look at this is that as the, as the disciples begin to have their expectations disrupted and they begin to understand that the kingdom of God comes differently than the kingdoms of this world, that kingdom power is a power to go, it's not to consolidate. The kingdom power, it, it actually, like, it gives, it doesn't take. That kingdom power is good news for everybody as they begin to go into places they never thought God cared about, what happens is they become more and more prayerful and more and more dependent because they don't understand it, right? Like, it's like, where are we supposed to go next? They're always getting surprised by what God's doing and where he's showing up. And so I think there's this freedom that we're offered in this passage. That the... The call of God to be on mission is not a call to be an expert. It's not a call to have all the answers. It's not a call to have a great strategy. It's a call to join in what God is already doing. It's a call to be a, a proclaimer of the good news that Jesus has come. He's defeated death. He reigns in heaven and he's coming again. And he, and that's good news for everybody. That is the invitation to be on mission. And because of that, we can be a people who pray and wait and respond. That is the rhythm of the book of Acts. And I'm hesitant. This, past, this part of this message is always a little hard for me to preach because I'm actually really bad at praying. Like, that's like not, I'm not an intercessor, like, naturally. Um, I have friends that are great intercessors, and I really appreciate them. But... The more I'm on, I've walked with Jesus, like the more I pray. And I don't mean like I'm never going to be like the leader of the prayer ministry, I don't think. But like the more I realize, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I want to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, I never thought I'd be here, but you are here and I need to like show me what's the next step. And there's this response and this dependency because in God's kingdom, there's no experts, but there's an invitation to be humble and to listen and respond to what Jesus is doing. Amen. Praying not knowing becomes the goal in this new kingdom paradigm. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But, my sister mentioned that I spent some time on the mission field, and um, I, I served in the nation of Cambodia, which is in Southeast Asia. And, and one of my jobs I had a lot then was hosting teams that would come, and we did a lot of construction teams. And um, some were great. Others were not very good at construction. Um, but I remember this one team. 
And they came to build a fence at one of the churches in the orphan homes. And, and it was the worst fence we ever built. <laughs> I had to drive past it all the time after they left. And I just was like so embarrassed. I was like, oh my gosh, that is the most crooked fence. And you know what happened? The problem was is that they knew how to build a fence in their country. And we brought in a Cambodian contractor, and, and he tried to lead them, but they're like, no, it's much better if we're exact, we do it our way. And the thing is, in Cambodia, none of the, the supplies are exact, so you do everything, you do a lot more by eye and things, not like measured exactly. But they kept insisting that it was better, like we, got, we had all these like levels and things going, and we were just, the Cambodians were like. <laughs> the result was the crookedest fence in Cambodia. <laughs> Because the materials weren't the same, we weren't in the same place, and so everything was just slightly. And I tell you that story because I think it's a good metaphor for what happens if we try to bring what our expectations into this mission that God's inviting us to. If we say, God, this is how I want you to do this, or this is how your kingdom should come in this place, the problem is, is that we end up like that fence, just like a little bit off. Because the kingdom of God is not the kingdom of this world. The way that other things happen here, the way power is consolidated, or the way we build things or make things happen is not the way of the kingdom. Kingdom moves forth in unperceptible ways of sacrifice, obedience, and giving up our rights. That the kingdom is established. And that somehow this baby that was born in the middle of a, gen like a, a genocide situation in the, in, in the middle of an empire with a, that, was, that was oppressing a people, that somehow this baby, who never had a position, didn't live past, 33 on earth in bodily form somehow turn the world upside down because kingdom power isn't like other power. And we are to be people who allow our expectations to be transformed, that go with Jesus to unexpected places and, and have a posture of prayer and dependency. And when we do those things, he brings the kingdom. He restores lives. He heals. He puts back together, and we get to be a part of it. And so I just want to close with this question. Can we trust that Jesus' way is better than our way? Can we trust that what is unseen is actually more real than what is seen? Would we allow Jesus to lead us to broken places in this world and engage them because we know that his that he is working and this kingdom has come and is coming and we get to declare it and in the most unlikely places let's pray father god we thank you Lord, we thank you that your kingdom is so different and and because of that we have such hope. Because of that, we have good news for everybody. That we don't have, we get to proclaim, we don't have to worry about whether you're in charge. Lord, we know you are and you're for all people. And so, Lord, today I pray if any of us find ourselves in a place where we have been trying to muscle what we think you should do into our, our circumstance. I pray that right now you would just release, that you would give us the strength and the wisdom to release that to you. That I say, Jesus, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, which means that I probably won't understand it, but I can be a part of it. And so, Lord, would you bring to mind the places that we are missing the fact that you're at work? Would you open our eyes? Would you give us courage to trust you in those places? And Lord, with our lives, with our posture, with the way we go about our, our work, Lord, declare good news of great, with great joy to all people. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you.